Our next speaker is Emily Petrov. Emily is a PhD candidate in the Centre for Astrophysics and Supercomputing at Swinburne University. She studies extreme objects in both our own galaxy and in galaxies halfway across the universe. She loves travel, fine whiskey, and used books. Ladies and gentlemen, Emily. I get short person height? Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's been amazing hearing about everybody else's science stories, and so I'm not really sure how I managed to snag an invitation to this, but it's great to be here. Um, I'm really feeling very inspired and also extremely worthless hearing about all the wonderful scientists that came before. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, I'm an astrophysicist, and instead of talking to you about one of my heroes in astronomy, I'm going to tell you about a biologist, um, even though I fully admit that biology was my absolute worst subject in school. Um, but he's my hero nonetheless. So there are many astronomers that I look up to and admire. Um, I could tell you about Ruby Payne Scott, who's a, who is the first female radio astronomer. And I could tell you about Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who discovered pulsars. And as a radio astronomy student who studies pulsars, both of those people would be great people to talk about. But um, sometimes you come across a story that is so remarkable that you need to tell people about it. Um, even if you have to mentally apologize to all your powerhouse female astronomy people. Uh, so, but this is the life of an astronomy geek, uh, apologizing in my head to, uh, to people who came before, so sorry. All right, but <laughs> today I'm going to tell you about someone who you've probably never heard of, and that's a man called Jacques Monod. So most of the information I've actually learned about this man uh, came from this fantastic book called Brave Genius that I highly recommend that you read if you have any spare time at all. And I'll be telling you a bit about him tonight, but if you'd like to learn more, you can find it there. So as you could probably guess, a man named Jacques Monod is French. <laughs> so he was born in the south of France in 1910 uh, to a French father and an American mother. So that's quite an unusual combination at that time. He did his lycée, which is just a fancy French word for high school, um, <laughs> in Cannes, and then moved to Paris in 1928. And he studied biology at the Sorbonne. So after completing his undergraduate studies, he did what many a soon-to-be famous researcher does. He went to grad school. And in the late 1930s, uh, Jacques Monod was a character that I think many PhD students could sympathize with. Um, he was a 30-year-old graduate student who couldn't seem to complete his thesis. <laughs> Maybe, wow, there were a lot more laughs than I expected. Have some of you guys been there? We've all been there. <laughs> Um, so at this point in the story, I find him extremely relatable. <laughs> um, and in fact, he was very hopeful about his thesis, just like many of us. Um, and he was thinking, you know what, I'm going to finish my PhD in the year 1940. That's going to be a good year to finish my PhD. This was extremely bad luck. Because in 1940, Germany invaded France and occupied Paris, and that changed everything. So uh, Monod had actually gotten married during graduate school, and he had twin sons who were born on August 5th, 1939. So that was four weeks before France declared war. Um, and when the Nazis inven eventually invaded France, Monod relocated his Jewish wife and their sons with false identities in the countryside while he resumed his, re his research in Paris. After a brief stint in the French army, he returned to Paris and was granted a desk at the Pasteur Institute. Uh, to resume his, his research on bacteria and enzymes. Uh, biology people, is that exciting? I don't know. Um, but anyway, <laughs> again, I'm an astronomer. I don't do this stuff. <laughs> um, and that would eventually win him the Nobel Prize. Um, so as you can probably tell, it's not really Minot's work that I'm going to tell you about tonight. Um, at least, I mean, that's not why he's one of my heroes. Obviously, he was doing great work. But it's the things that he did that made him an excellent human not an excellent scientist, that make him stand out for me the most. So during the war, Monod helped found the FFI. And the FFI is the French Forces of the Interior. And that was an underground resistance group, which would go on to play a significant role in the Allied fight for France in 1944. In fact, he was so central to the FFI that um, on the numbered identity cards, his number was number two. So he was the second person to hold an FFI identity card. And during the war, he conducted FFI business out of his home and out of his lab, 
um, often using research visits and meetings as cover for operations against the Nazis. Uh, so this is the first of several instances where Minot really stood up to fight for what was right, even though it could have cost him his life. So um, during the war, many of his friends and colleagues in the FFI were arrested, deported, beaten, tortured, and killed. So part of participating in the French resistance was dangerous and frustrating, and in many cases, survival came down to luck. But fortunately, Minot was very lucky, and he survived the war with his secret identity secure. So after the war, Minot resumed his research full time, and this was his most productive period. He and his colleagues were working on the forefront of enzyme regulation. And I don't really understand what enzyme regulation is at all, so I'm not gonna tell you much about this, but they were finding very interesting things that were very hard to explain. And <laughs> in any field of science, that's a good place to be. <laughs> um, so eventually, Minot and his team would go on to find that genetics control the production of enzymes. And this was at a time when genetics were not very well understood. So this would be the breakthrough that led to the understanding of how genetic traits are expressed, um, or basically why things are the way they are given the genetics that they inherit. So apparently this was a big deal in biology. Again, I'm not an expert. <laughs> but in the parts of his life that make him so interesting to me, Minot was standing out as well. Uh, he had joined the Communist Party during the war to participate in the resistance, um, because for many groups this was a requirement but he left the party just after the war at a time when many other people were flocking to communism uh, because he didn't agree with communism and with the persecution of scientists under communist regimes in the USSR. And he was actually one of the few scientists at the time to publicly speak out about the treatment of scientists uh, in, these, in these oppressive regimes, writing opinion pieces in French newspapers and scientific journals. So that was amazing, way to go Minot. <laughs> His editorial arguments with prominent party scientists in the USSR in, 1950, in the 1950s, which were actually published in a journal that was run by his friend Albert Camus, um, attracted the attention of scientists working in repressive conditions in Hungary. And one of these scientists, Agnes Ullmann, visited the Pasteur Institute in 1958 and 1959. And Ullmann had participated in the Hungarian Revolution, uh, which happened in 1956, and she and her husband no longer felt safe in Hungary. And um, I think this was a completely justified feeling, considering that during the revolution, um, her lab desk mate at her institute was executed by the state. So it was not a very good time to be in Hungary. And during her visit um, with Minot, he felt her plight very keenly and tried to get her a visa from the French government, which, of course, flatly refused. Um, and she had to return to Hungary in 1959. But in 1960, Minot spent a great deal of his time and a large sum of his money to smuggle Agnes Ullmann and her husband out of Hungary to the West. Um, they actually did this. This is an amazing story. They did this by hiding under a bathtub compartment in a camper trailer. And then Minot paid someone who had no idea that they were even in there to drive the camper trailer across the border. Um, amazing. <laughs> so this sounds like a plot for some crazy spy movie. Um, but this is actually the life of scientists during the Cold War. Ugh. Um, so we're, we're, we're living better times now, it's good. Um, so this is both, both horrific and also kind of amazing. Um, my life as a scientist will probably never be that cool. <laughs> um, and, and, but Minot went on to help Agnes win a fellowship and continue her research with him at the Pasteur Institute in, in the 1960s. Um, and, and so, you know, Jacques Minot continued to be a completely awesome person and all the while doing this groundbreaking science. So in 1965, he won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine with two of his colleagues, so it's Andre Wolf and Francois Jacob, for their work on the discovery of how genetics control the synthesis of enzymes and cells and viruses. That's like the official, the official line. <laughs> um, it was a big win for their group in more ways than one. Um, not only did it acknowledge the obviously fantastic work coming out of their group and their lab and the Pasteur Institute in general, but it was also a source of this immense national pride. Um, no one from France had won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine since 1928, and that particular prize went to um, the most fantastic French name of all, Charles-Jules-Henri Nicole, um, for figuring out that lice causes typhus. Um, so not since they figured out that lice causes typhus had anybody in France won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine. So that's a pretty big win. Um, and as tends to happen when one one wins the Nobel Prize, as you do. Uh, <laughs> Minot and his colleagues became overnight celebrities. 
Um, I think the thing that no one gives much thought to about becoming a Nobel Prize winner, I mean, you're so busy focused on the science, right? So you don't really think about how much your opinion suddenly means. Um, so as a recent Nobel Prize winner, just for example, uh, you could hold a press conference and say that you, um, I don't know, you could think, that, say, like, broccoli is the worst vegetable ever. I hate broccoli. And then suddenly, uh, people are going to start quoting you on that and pointing to you for the reason why they don't eat broccoli anymore. And um, you're, you might even like impact the national sales of broccoli. Uh, as a scientist, this is not something that you're prepared for. Um, you're used to working in your lab or used to working on your research, and that can be very difficult to deal with. Um, Minot's great friend, Albert Camus, who also won the Nobel Prize um, and also had a very strong moral compass, dealt with this very gracefully. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for literature, and in the three short years between when he won his prize and when he tragically died in a car accident, um, he used his, pro his platform uh, to protest the French treatment of Algerians, protest against the war in Algeria, and argue for Algerian independence, which he actually didn't live to see. It happened two years after he died. Um, so Camus was a natural at using his Nobel pl Prize platform for good, and so, as it turns out, was Jacques Monod. Uh, Monod continued to speak out strongly against the treatment of scientists and the scientific method under the Soviet communist regime, standing up to the USSR when his government was not. Um, and that's a pretty bold move, standing up to the USSR by your lonesome, so well done. <laughs> um, and much like Camus, Monod also ended up speaking out against the French government. So in May 1968, the students of Paris began to revolt against uh, or demonstrate against the French government because the universities were overcrowded and they weren't getting the proper education they wanted. Um, and as often happens with student protests, um, they got violent and they clashed with the police and the police were starting to, uh, you know, to abuse students and, and arrest and uh, you know, be very mean to students. <laughs> So at the Sorbonne, um, where Monod himself had studied 30 years ago, the police started firing tear gas at the students in May 1968. Um, Monod wasn't even at the Sorbonne. He was working at the Pasteur Institute, when it, which was in another, uh, another suburb. Um, but he heard what was happening, and he went over to the Sorbonne. And so there's this fantastic picture from that day in 1968 that I, I'm hoping will get tweeted out tonight, um, where um, there's this, this picture of a paramedic on one side and Jacques Minot on the other side, leading a student with bandages over her eyes through the streets of Paris, away from the protests. And it's such a fantastically powerful image. Um, I think it, you know, it speaks a lot about him as a person. He was in his 50s at that point. Um, he's this middle-aged researcher working in a lab, and he didn't have to do that. He, you know, he, was, he was there supporting the students and, and fighting for what he believed in. Um, he felt very strongly about their cause, and he actually started speaking out against, this, uh, against the government and how they were treating the students. And, and uh, that actually helped. Because, I mean, if you're a government, and one of your very, very famous new Nobel Prize winners starts speaking out against you, uh, you look very, very bad. <laughs> So poli police brutality against the students really calmed down after that. And I think that had a lot to do with, with, with Jacques Minot. And it really brings it back to why I admire him so much. Um, I mean, for us, as normal citizens, it's pretty easy to say bad things about the government in a democracy. All you have to do is check Facebook and see what your high school friends are up to, um, and you'll hear some sort of crazy bullshit. Um, <laughs> But to do so openly and eloquently when you know the world is going to listen to you, is going to quote you, and is going to judge you is extremely brave. And Minot did it because he felt so strongly that this was the right thing. And I mean, this is why he's my hero. He's been doing this his whole life, from joining the French resistance against the Nazis, to defending scientists in totalitarian regimes, to helping scientists in danger from pre persecution to safety, uh, to standing up for the rights of students. Um, he was not only a gifted scientist, but he was fundamentally a good person. And, you know, he's the kind of person that we should all try to be. So he died when he was 66, but I'd say that he made all of that time count. So in short, he was a huge badass. Thank you. <laughs>